All right, I think we'll um, get into it. I'll continue to um, admit folks into the waiting room as we go. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for um, being here. And um, of course, thanks to our speakers as well. Um, I'm Catherine Klosek, ARL's Director of Information Policy and Federal Relations. Um, I want to note um, up top that you should have uh, gotten the notification that we're recording this, um, this session, and we're also going to try to capture the transcript as well, um, because um, we know that there have been, um, there's probably going to be questions and, and whatnot in the chat. Um, uh, and I guess that's a, a suggestion to add your questions to the chat as we as we kind of go along here. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there have been a lot of conversations in the research library community um, around in the library community in general um, around Title II. And so just want to acknowledge um, the American Library Association, Library Publishing Coalition, Library Accessibility Alliance and Big Ten Academic Alliance um, as just some of the organizations that have been focused on this. And um, we've linked to some of their resources and webinars um, in uh, in this sort of pre-read doc that we put together, which I'm going to share in the chat right now. Um, you can follow along in this document. I think we might update it after this conversation, and then we'll make sure that everyone has um, has access to it as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, uh, yeah, I think that. Sorry, I'm still admitting folks. Um, Okay, yeah, I think um, with that, I'm gonna kick it off um, to Liz Larang to please um, say a few words of welcome in her capacity um, as BTAA liaison to the Library Accessibility Alliance. So um, Liz, uh, you have the floor. Great, well, good afternoon, everyone from Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm Liz Larang, Dean of Libraries at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I, as Catherine said, I also serve as the representative from the Big Ten Academic Alliance Library Directors Group to the Library Accessibility Alliance. And it's important for me to say that um, I volunteered for that position just recently and specifically so that I can learn more about the LAA's work and accessibility efforts more broadly um, in both academic and research libraries. So so I am not here today as an expert, but certainly as a fellow learner. Um, but I've taken my task today to be really mood setting uh, for the session. And I won't talk long, but I do, when I get to mood setting, need you to stick with me for a couple of minutes because the mood I sketch at the outset is not where we will end, I promise. Uh, but first, I want to thank the Association of Research Libraries, especially Catherine Klosik, for organizing this opportunity and for bringing together both breadth and depth of expertise as we all look to uphold principles of accessibility in our organizations and respond to ADA Title II requirements. Now for a little bit of mood setting. In a piece of speculative fiction that is part of her work staying with the trouble, Donna Haraway looks back on our present era of history from a time in the future and describes it as, quote, the great dithering. So in the great dithering, people were well aware of the major and existential threats to the planet and to living well, but they didn't bring themselves to action. They dithered about until the time for productive action had passed. Unfortunately, we're probably or perhaps even closer to a great dithering now than when Haraway wrote nearly a decade ago. And a great dithering might occur because no solution appears ideologically pure enough or does not address every facet of a pro problem. A great dithering might also occur because people feel overwhelmed by the scope and scale of the problem. A great dithering might also occur because those with power to act just decide that they're actually fine with the status quo because it's working for them, others and the future be damned. So Haraway's uh, great dithering actually represented a convergence of these forces. In my own experience, uh, we in academic research libraries can find ourselves hung up as a result of two of those forces, uh, when a solution does not appear ideologically pure enough or is not fully comprehensive enough, or when we focus on all that can and perhaps even should be done, and then we begin to feel a sense of overwhelm set in. So in my organization, I've already sensed some of these responses around efforts to, res to respond to Title II. 
And this is not a criticism by any means of anyone in my library or in the profession. The work is hard, the work is real, we have a lot to do, um, but we do have an opportunity for collective self-reflection and recalibration towards action. Here's where the mood begins to shift. So wherever we're starting from as individuals or organizations and responding to Title II, or wherever we are in our journey, today's session is designed to encourage us toward a mood of uplift, of possibility, and of agency, and to understand and respond to Title II as an opportunity to more fully lean into our values as information professionals and to make time and space for work that we already value and sometimes have struggled to make time and space for amidst all of our other um, commitments and obligations. Atmosphere and mood are vital and they also only go so far. So our experts today also will share questions, frameworks and resources, as well as paths for strategizing and prioritizing our effort and to understand and appreciate the roles of both humans and technology in our responses to Title II. So with this mood setting welcome and framing, it's my pleasure to turn the reins over to today's moderator, Blake Reed who is an associate professor in the College of Law at the University of Colorado. And professor Reed focuses on telecommunications, internet, copyright, and disability law. And he brings expertise both from prior experience in legal practice, as well as his experience in legal research and teaching. Welcome everyone. Blake, over to you. Thanks so much, Liz. Can you hear me okay? All right, I see nodding all around. I uh, will go with that. Well, it is uh, lovely uh, to be here with you all today and um, great to see so many uh, old friends and, and hopefully uh, new ones. And um, one of the reasons that I uh, agreed to moderate this session, having spent uh, a lot of time on the accessibility of technology and content in my career is I can't think of a better um, group of folks to get together to talk about the um, incredibly important uh, challenges and opportunities uh, that this moment presents to, uh, to bring uh, libraries um, to a more uh, accessible uh, place and make them uh, make them a, a, a center of, of equity as they always uh, have been um, for, for all patrons. Um, so it is my role as moderator today to uh, walk us through. So this is probably the most you're going to hear from me uh, for a little while. Um, our agenda, uh, we're, we're going to start with an overview of the, the regulations um, and then dive down into uh, some of the kind of thorny uh, specific questions that have uh, have come up and hear from uh, several experts on that. We'll shift over to a conversation about the licensing of accessible uh content. And then uh, this is where everyone else comes in. We will uh, shift to a discussion with all of the speakers. Um, so uh, as we go along, please feel free uh, to enter your questions in the chat. Um, we've got a fantastic crew of folks who are going to be monitoring the chat, including uh, Jonathan Band, ARL's Copyright Counsel, Brandon Butler, uh, the Executive Director of the Recreate Coalition, Rachel Sandberg, uh, who's the Director of Scholarly Communication and Information Policy at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and Nancy Sims, the Director of Copyright and Scholarly communication at the University of Minnesota libraries. They'll be monitoring the chat, as will I. Um, to the extent that you've got very specific questions, uh, they will try and pick up on them. Uh, to the extent that you've got overarching questions, we'll try and bring them uh, into the discussion as we go, and we'll have uh, lots of opportunities uh, at that point uh, to discuss, and then we'll uh, we'll close out with some next steps. All right, let's get into it. Um, I'm pleased to hand it over to Nancy Horton, the Associate Director of the Mid Atlantic ADA Center, and Nancy's going to give us an overview of the new Title II regulations. Nancy, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for having me here today. Um, as Blake said, I am. Uh, my name is Nancy Horton. I'm with the Mid-Atlantic Americans with Disabilities Act Center, and I'm going to just give a very brief kind of 10,000-foot view <laughs> overview of the new uh, of the new rule, and I'm I have a few slides to share, so I'm going to attempt to do that. Um, I hope everyone is able to to see that. 
We can see them. It looks like it's not in present. Yep, you're good. Thanks, Nancy. Okay. Um, uh, again, I'm going to give just a brief overview. This is the name of the new rule, non-discrimination on the basis of disability, accessibility of web information and services of state and local government entities, um, otherwise known as public entities in ADA land. Um, the Mid-Atlantic uh, ADA Center is one of 10 regional ADA centers located all around uh, the country. So if you are in the United States uh, or uh, one of its territories or the District of Columbia, you have an ADA center that serves your, your area. Uh, this is some information I have to tell everybody um, to acknowledge that the ADA uh, centers are funded by the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, research. and that uh, we're not, uh, nothing we're saying is uh, legal advice. So again, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the new rule. We're gonna talk about how it applies, the compliance dates for the entities that are covered under this rule, um, the technical standards that have now been established to measure compliance, and sort of put, try to put that into the framework of Title II, uh, which has been around for nearly 35 years at this point. And so we'll touch on some of the, the core concepts of, of Title II, where this new rule, uh, you know, lives. So first of all, the, the, the basic rule, you know, Title II of the ADA, applies to all programs, services, and activities of state and local governments. So the new rule uh, does a couple things. It adds a whole new subpart, subpart H, to the regulation, which is at 28 uh, CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulations, part 35, um, to ensure access for people with disabilities to web content and mobile apps that are made available either directly or through contracts, licenses, or other arrangements, um, because many public entities uh, do hire contractors and so forth to uh, conduct their programs on their behalf or engage in activities or provide them with things like um, you know, web content. So first of all, compliance dates, um, which are important for covered entities. Um, this time is, is laid out in the rule to give covered entities uh, time to prepare, to implement the rule. So for most entities, most state and local government agencies, it's gonna go by the population of the entity. It might be a state, if it's say a state university system or a state department of something or a county or a city, those with total population, that's total population of uh, 50,000 or more, the compliance date is April 24th of 2026. So it's two years from the date of the rule, the date the rule was issued. For smaller entities up to 49,999 total population, they get, they get a little more time. Um, they get about another, uh, another year, April 26th. I think they gave them a, the Sunday off or something there. Um, of 2027 will be the compliance date for those smaller entities. And that is the compliance date as well for special district governments which are public entities. They're not counties or towns or independent school districts, but, they're, but they are public entities that are authorized under state law, usually to provide a specific or a limited number of specific uh, functions. And, and they have sufficient autonomy to sort of uh, qualify as a separate uh, government entity, and they, they don't have a, a population calculation. These are sometimes things like a water and sewer authority or, or something of that nature. So for other entities, 
on, on the next slide here. This is the definition of how these other entities will figure out their compliance date. Total population is based on calculated estimates from the US Census Bureau. So if an entity has that kind of a population uh, estimate, they're gonna go by the most recent decennial census. For independent school districts or instrumentalities of independent school districts, they're gonna go by the most recent small area income and poverty estimates. Now, if there are entities other than special district governments or independent school districts, which we just saw where they, where they fit, um, and they don't have a population estimate, but they are an instrumentality or a commuter authority of one or more state or local governments that do have a population estimate, then the, those entities will go by that, will go by that population estimate to figure out where their compliance date is. The earlier date, which is typically for the larger entities or the, the later date for smaller entities. So now that we know who we are and what we're looking at, um, what are we looking at in terms of uh, what we need to, to comply with? Um, specifically, this, this rule, this is something really important about this rule, is that it adopts and establishes a technical standard, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, often uh, referred to as WCAG uh, 2.1. This is the 2018 version level double A, that is the technical standard that we'll be using as sort of the yardstick to measure what accessibility really looks like in the online environment. This, um, the, the WCAG is, is the result of, it's an international guideline is established under the Web Accessibility Initiative or WAI, which is part of the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C, and I've got a screenshot here of their website. This is an absolutely fabulous resource for just about anyone of any type, uh, level, of uh, interest um, when it comes to web accessibility. So web content of, of all these state and local government entities needs to comply with this technical standard unless compliance would result in a fundamental alteration in the nature of a program, service, or activity, or create, uh, cause undue financial and administrative burdens. And these are some very basic um, limitations of Title II. They've been in Title II since day one. This isn't something new about this rule. These are limitations that have always been in Title II and are available for pretty much any uh, of Title II's um, requirements. So on our next slide, in addition to those sort of very basic uh, limitations, we have some specific exceptions to the new rule. We have five specific exceptions. One is for archived web content, and there's a four-part definition of what that means down at the bottom of this slide, I've placed uh, the definition of web content. You know, again, just to make sure in case there's anybody in the room who doesn't know what the web is. Uh, I think we all pretty much know what web content is, but it's, it's the stuff that's there, the information and sensory experience that's intended to be communi communicated to us users out here in the world, including the code and the markup that's under the hood there that defines the structure and presentation and interaction of the content. Some examples, text, images, sounds, videos, controls, animations, conventional electronic documents. Um, so, you know, the stuff that's there. So any of this that meets this, all four parts of this four part definition would, would come under this uh, first exception. It was created before the date the public entity is required to comply with this new rule or re reproduces paper documents or the contents of other physical media created before the compliance date. So that could be you know, old photographs that you scanned or things of that nature. 
It's retained exclusively for reference research or record, record keeping. It is not altered or updated after the date it's archived. And it's organized and stored in a dedicated area that is clearly identified as an archive. So exception number two is for pre-existing conventional electronic documents. And again, down below, I've put the definition of what that is, conventional electronic documents. And this is a definition that's not, these are, this is not a list of examples. This is it. This is what, this is all that conventional electronic documents are. They're, they're PDFs, portable document formats, or they're documents in a word processor, presentation, or spreadsheet format. You know, your Word documents, PowerPoint, Excel, things of that nature. Uh, Pre-existing documents like this um, fall under an exception unless they are currently used to apply for, gain access to, or participate in a public entity's services, programs, or activities. Now, these are the last three of the five exceptions, I've put them all together. They're fairly straightforward. The third exception is content posted by a third party unless it's posted due to a contractual licensing or, or other arrangement with the public entity. Um, again, this, is, this recognizes something that's been part of Title II from, from the beginning. Um, if a state or local government agency you know, hires a contractor, to build its website, just like if they hire a contractor to build their building, the public entity is still responsible for that. But they're not responsible for uh, the things that um, uh, third parties that they're not responsible for, not affiliated with, um, may post on their social media site or something of that nature, or a resource that they might link to that's outside of their own their own responsibility, things of that nature. Also, the fourth exception is individualized conventional electronic documents that are about a specific individual, their property or their account, and is password protected or otherwise secured. So this might be an individual's bill or something like that, where they only they would have access to that. And the final exception is for pre-existing social media posts. Again, pre-existing meaning before the compliance date uh, that the, the public entity is, is subject to. Now, there is an additional allowance for conforming alternate, um, alternate ways to make uh, web content accessible. This is allowed only when it's not possible to make web content accessible due to technical or legal limitations. So this would be where you would have a separate web page or a separate um, uh, you know, content um, to try to give that, give that information, make it available to people with disabilities. The content needs to be comparable to the inaccessible content that it's sort of duplicating uh, in terms of the information and the functions that are available to people to do. It needs to be kept up to date, this, like the, the inaccessible version, and it needs to be easy to find. It needs to be easy for people to find it and, and access it. So this is a sort of a narrow uh, allowance. It's a little bit different from the, uh, the, the exceptions that we sort of just looked over. So, and this is just sort of, this is a quote here from the Department of Justice's rulemaking. This is from the section of the regulation. They always provide guidance and background information on their rules, which is a lot of great information you can always find in these um, guidance and section by section analyses in, in uh, federal rulemaking. And it's just a quote where the Department of Justice wants to emphasize that even if you've got web content or something that um, is, is accepted from having to meet 
the standards because the department wants uh, covered entities to focus on uh, new stuff and important stuff, stuff that's currently needed, currently used. Um, but even if something is accepted, then you still have those overarching obligations that we find in Title II to ensure equity for people with disabilities and to respond to individuals on an individualized basis. So you may need to make an electronic document that's eligible for an exception. You may need to make that accessible or provide the information or the functionality um, in a, in a, to, on an individual basis if uh, requested, if needed. So again, that's a very quick trot through um, through this new rule. There's a lot of nuance, there's a lot more to it, but I'm hoping that at least gets us all on the same page. And again, just to remind folks, um, the ADA National Network is nationwide. I'm here in the Mid-Atlantic uh, region, um, but again, there are centers all over the country. You can reach your regional center at 800-949-4232. This is a nationwide number that works based on the area code of the phone number that you call from. That's gonna connect you to the region that's associated um, with, that, with that center. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn things back over so that folks can get into the, into the discussion that, that folks wanna to have today. Thanks so much, Nancy. That was a terrific overview, and I think we'll have those slides available for folks that want uh, to review them uh, later. Uh, it is now uh, my pleasure to shift over to some of the thorny details uh, of the regulations you just marched through. And in the uh, the spirit of the mood shift that happened at the beginning, I think we're going to start with something that might be a little bit scary, but then we'll start to answer some questions and to scare us a little bit, but only a little bit, uh, is Hannah LeVay, who's a collection assessment librarian uh, at the University of Washington. Hannah, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I do have some big questions that I've seen um, surfaced in various conversations about this topic recently, and um, I do have a general sense that we're all a little scared. You know, librarians are traditionally committed to providing access to information to everyone, including people with disabilities. And I like to think as a profession, we've been forward thinking about addressing accessibility already, but the new ruling has definitely gotten us nervous. Um, you know, we tend to rely on standards and systems for doing our work, and we don't really have examples yet of how to address the new ruling. Um, and examples that we found in the documentation around the ruling don't really match up to our actual library's um, environment. So I wanted to list out a few scenarios that um, have come up in these conversations um, as questions. So um, third-party electronic resources is a big one. Um, I do work with this myself. I try to figure out if our resources are um, accessible. Um, and we have no control over these or third parties, so um, how do we influence them to make their products accessible? Some of us have hundreds of subscriptions, so it's a challenge just, first of all, to find out which ones are not accessible. Um, at University of Washington, we do this usability-based keyboard navigation test to kind of filter out um, the worst offenders, and then we look at their VPATs or ACRs. But um, it's still not a full picture. Um, BPATs are often uh, unreliable or maybe just um, the vendors don't know what they're doing even sometimes when they're filling them out. So that's a big question. How do we, how do we find those inaccessible products? And then how do we address the vendors with license language, um, indemnification clauses? Um, and then we have extra challenges if they're foreign vendors who might not be familiar with our laws. Um, we might have products that we don't have a direct license, so we don't really have any power in those conversations. Um, and then sometimes we have these products that are unique and have no alternatives that are accessible. So we don't really have the option to cancel those resources because that would be um, you know, a fundamental alteration of our essential services, as they say in the um, accessibility language. 
Uh, so that's a big one. <laughs> um, another issue we have is for institutional repositories where we um, have documents stored on our local library sites. And while we have a lot more control over these, um, there's a lot of content in there, years and years of documents. Does this fall under the archive web content exception? There's a lot of steps in that exception. Um, how do we know which of those documents we need to remediate? Um, and then as it, even if it does fall under the exception, um, how do we know which items are gonna be used in order to remediate those first before, um, before they get used? That's probably impossible, but um, that is our question. And then another big one I've seen around is our digital archives. Um, for example, an oral history collection, Content DM. Does this fall under the digital archive exemption? Um, what about new items added to the collection that's already there? Uh, there's just so many little details about these exceptions and um, how we address that. What about if we're applying for a grant for a digital collection of sound recordings? Would we need to work into that grant request additional money for making that collection accessible? So um, those are some of the major areas I've seen surface from, from other conversations. Um, and I'd like to address our discomfort in not having clarity on what to do. And so um, we just need to come up together with plans and procedures and timelines for remediation. Um, oh, and what are the consequences if we haven't achieved 100% compliance on April 27th, 2026? Um, will it be enough just to have remediation plans? Plans in place and show that we're doing our due diligence. So to wrap it up, um, how do we stay focused on our common professional goal of providing access to information rather than getting bogged down and terrified by the um, frustrating and uh, frightening realm of compliance and liability? So hopefully I've scared you all. <laughs> All right, womp womp. Thank you, Hannah. You you've done the job normally performed by lawyers, uh, 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 scaring scaring people. Uh, but now uh, we we have the great pleasure uh, to to try and untangle some of these questions about third party electronic resources, institutional repositories, digital archives, non compliance, managing third parties, and so forth. And we are going to start with Nancy Sims, who uh, is uh, as mentioned the director of copyright and scholarly comms. Uh, at the University of Minnesota Libraries, um, who's going to share uh, a little bit with us about uh, how her library is preparing to answer, uh, interpret, and implement, excuse me, uh, some of these exact regulations. Nancy, over to you. Thanks. Um, oddly enough, I'm going to be a lawyer who's going to try to, to decrease the fear. Um, this, is, this is just a strange role reversal. Uh, so, the first thing I have to say is, is something that, uh, which is I, I'm not an in-depth expert on ADA compliance and certainly not with electronic documents. We are lucky enough to have uh, some people in our library who are uh, much more, uh, have, have much more expertise on that, including Amy Dreyer, who's our web accessibility lead. And um, we have a task force under our uh, director of equity and inclusion and accessibility, uh, Patricia Isaac. Uh, Patricia has convened a task force. Amy is one of the people on it. Um, we have representation there from our e-resources teams, from our IT teams, from our digital collections teams, from just like everybody who this is going to touch on in the entire library um, is represented on the task force. And we've had a few meetings. And one of the things we've already started doing is making a list of what might qualify for the archived web content exception and talking about things like e-resources where we don't think they will qualify um, subscription e-resources. Um, that's about as much detail as I can go into in terms of what we are functionally doing because that's about as far as we have gotten, which is about as far as everybody else has gotten too. Um, so I'm going to shift gears in the next couple of minutes here and just say that um, one thing we're looking at, and certainly one thing that the ARL documentation does, is uh, you know looking at what our subscription uh, licenses do in these places. Um, our subscription licenses usually say the things have to be accessible already, uh, because this has been a requirement to some degree uh, under various parts of the ADA for quite a while. Um, 
whether our vendors are fully up on US accessibility requirements is one thing and whether they are meeting technical standards is another thing because the technical standards have not typically been um, specifically uh, written down in, in many of the regs before. Um, the negotiations with our vendors um, may require things like saying, if you don't provide the level of service you promised, we are not going to pay you because you are not holding up your end of the deal. I mean, I can't actually imagine a library doing that because libraries typically never say they won't pay their contractors, even when our contractors are not holding up their ends of the deal. But that is actually a thing people do in business. If you have a contract, you don't have to follow your end of the deal if the other party is not following their end of the deal. I don't see that being likely. Uh, just because it's not a typical practice in our field, but it is something to think about, you know, in the very back pocket of that this is essential and they're able to make it accessible, but they're not holding up their end of the deal. We do have some um, heavy handed enforcement mechanisms. Less heavy handed would be saying we might not be able to renew with you if you can't meet the, these standards um, or coming back to the table and saying, you know, we have alternatives to your product that do meet some accessibility requirements. Sometimes, unfortunately, we're not gonna have alternatives. A lot of our vendors are the only source of things. Um, so we, this is something where we're going to have to apply our negotiation skills. I'm really, really lucky that I also have skilled uh, e-resources staff, including our lead there, Sunshine Carter, who is tremendous at negotiation. And negotiation is not something every library is super comfortable with. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is shifting gears, again, away from the contract and subscriptions uh, to this compliance. How do we comply with this? Where do we, where do we follow the rule? How do we follow the rules? What do we do to avoid all risk? That seems to be what a lot of library folks are saying is what do we do to avoid all risk? Oh, if we do that, it might be risky. I would encourage you to try to take risk out of your calculations or not out, but to try to not to make that your focus. Um, regulations always have, when they're when they're new and newly written, there are always places where it's not exactly clear what you have to do co to comply with them. Um, we in libraries actually do have the experience needed to make reasonable guesses about how to comply with these regulations. Um, sometimes we might need to confer with our legal counsel or with ADA, ex ADA experts but we are the ones with the expertise about our programs and how achievable certain things are and what would be a fundamental alteration and whether we can do something that is an alternative. If there would be a fundamental alteration, what else can we do to make things accessible? We have expertise. And in some cases, we are the best positioned people to try to make guesses at how to address the gaps or not gaps even, but just fill in the edges of these regulations. So risk makes us feel nervous makes us feel afraid to interpret at all. But we have expertise, we have communities, we can work together um, to develop reasonable, functional, functional and implementable interpretations of the reg regulations in the spaces that we have questions. So that's about it for me for now. Thanks so much, Nancy. Uh, that is uh, a, a terrific uh, point to jump over uh, to Claire Stanley, who is the Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the American Council of the Blind. Um, Claire, uh, I want to turn it over to you, and I know you're going to focus on some of the big questions uh, that Hannah raised uh, about the many uh, exceptions that Nancy uh, marched through at the beginning. Claire, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Blake. Um, like Blake said, my name is Claire Stanley. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Governmental Affairs for the American Council of the Blind. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about, first of all, the reaction from um, the blind community as well as the disability community at large, and then how we kind of foresee some of this stuff playing forward in the next few years, and how we'd like to work with librarians because we know it's not an easy fix. But starting first and foremost, um, the blind and low vision community and again, the disability community at large, we were really excited to see this happen. Um, the promulgations of these regulations were first um, suggested during the Obama administration. It never happened. 
Um, and it took us, I think, something like 13 years for it to finally happen. Um, so we're excited. And we know, you know, I'm trying to, as I listen to you guys, have a somewhat sympathetic ear because I know it's not going to be easy. But I can tell you, I hate to say us and them or our side, but from our side, we're ecstatic because it's something that has been um, something we've long waited for. And access to a lot of resources is still really limiting. Um, we are, however, a little frustrated with some of the exceptions. Again, trying to have a sympathetic ear. Um, I know you guys have a big weight um, on your shoulders, but a lot of the exceptions really, again, limit um, a lot of the things we have access to. And I'll give an example in just a little bit. Um, we were excited that they, they initially started with seven exceptions and two of them were removed during the rulemaking process. Um, many of us in the disability community responded to the notice of proposed rulemaking, which is the process to come out with the regulations. I um, mean, we like to think that our advocacy and writing those comments eliminated those two um, exceptions. So we were excited to see that, but we're still concerned that so many of the um, exceptions will make it more difficult for us to get access to the things that we need. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, no, there go through my notes. Um, I, again, just a quick example before I move on. Things like um, the archived access, our archived materials and not having access to those um, until somebody makes an express request for them and then it has to be remediated. I've heard stories. So the American Council of the Blind is a membership organization, and we have members from across the country who are blind or low vision. I've heard stories of people who are working on PhD dissertations who need access to those truly archived long ago resources, um, and they're not available in an accessible format often. And so it makes it really hard for them to do the research that they need to write their dissertation. And there's lots of stories like that. So again, I know you guys are, a lot of you librarians are saying, oh, we have ways to do that. But just trying to give the the perspective we're coming from. Um, quickly to go through what we foresee, we the disability community foresee as far as implementation of the regulations and how they'll impact our community. Um, only legal interpretation will say how this plays out. You know, hopefully in an ideal world, everything will be done properly. Um, but again, hearing from your community, it is a big lift. I get that. And it's going to be really hard to implement. So if challenges are brought, which not to be a cynic, but challenges will be brought legally, um, how will the courts interpret these regulations? Um, historically, um, the, the court systems have not always seen kindly to disability rights law interpretations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Knock on wood, fingers crossed that won't be the case, but only time will tell. The Supreme Court has not been our friend, and um, especially with what the court looks like right now. So hopefully that won't happen. We're all going to play well in the sandbox. Everybody's going to comply with these new regulations. Um, but we're just kind of curious to see what will happen. But the last thing I want to say in this section is, um, and Nancy Horton did a great job talking about this, there is a provision under the ADA that talks about undue burdens. The, uh, and generally speaking, the one thing we do have on our side is that courts have generally been pretty, uh, they've held a high bar for when um, complainants say that there's an undue burden to um, make something accessible or to comply with the ADA. So we do have that on our side. So again, not trying to, to sound lofty, but you know, we do feel that at least in that respect, we will be able to, to see this um, carried on. And then the last quick session I section I wanted to talk about is uh, librarian obligations so talking to you guys but how we can work together from those of us who are blind who are excited about these new regulations so it'll benefit our community um, but how we can work together because again I hope you guys don't hear us saying yes we won you guys have to do this for us we really do think we can work together but again this is something really um, important to our community um so again, uh, going based off of some stuff Nancy Horton said, who's an expert in this law, despite any of the exceptions under Title II, like Nancy said, libraries still have to provide these materials upon request. So if they fall under exception, you still have to provide them or provide us these materials. So I kind of wanted to just use this last, last section to say, okay, so say it falls under exception, we still need those materials. Yes, it makes us a little more frustrated because we have to request it, but know that you still have to remediate the materials. And so kind of a question I wanted to pose is, is it easier to remediate in the situation where I, for instance, come and knock on your door and say, I need these materials, or is it easier to do it ahead of time? 
Now, I know you guys are librarians and you know this world far better than I. So you're probably saying, Claire, you're being way too Pollyannish. It's so much more difficult to remediate. Or if we try to ask our, you know, publishers to license, you know, these uh, uh, contracts to make accessible materials. See, I don't even speak your language. You're probably saying you're too Pollyannish to say, you know, make sure they do it ahead of time. But again, I just want to put that optimistic idea out there that it's a lot easier to do it ahead of time versus um, going back and trying to remediate. Um, again, just talking about Title II, this falls under effective communication under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just know that, again, even if it falls under exception, we're still going to request the materials. And is it easier to do it once we request it or is it easier to do it beforehand? And it probably has to do with um, when the information is published. We totally get that if it's an archive document from 50 years ago, it's a lot more difficult. But let's look now to 2024 and going forward that when documents are made right now, let's make them accessible from the get go so that we don't have these problems moving forward. Again, I don't work in publishing. I don't work with these contracts. So maybe I'm being too simplistic, but I just want those ideas to ring in our head as we work on it. Um, and again, just want to talk about how important this is as I close that I know for you guys, it's a really overwhelming idea to make materials accessible. But please understand from our perspective, this opens a world of access that we have been advocating for for so long, because it really does impact millions of Americans. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. And and I, I really appreciate those notes and wanted to tie in something uh, that someone just said in the chat. Uh, D. Kramer uh, says, low vision and blind librarians are very uh, excited about uh, the changes. Um, and so I, I, I hope that um, the, the spirit that you've advocated uh, for there, Claire, is going to also find uh, some some roots uh, among, among librarians them, themselves as well. Um, your last comments uh, on looking to new materials and, and sort of born accessible materials leaves us to the last sort of quadrant of our uh, prepared remarks. And for that, uh, I'm going to head over uh, to Sam Taremi, uh, who's a licensing librarian at the Uni University of California, Berkeley. And uh, Sam, you're on the agenda twice, but I want to just uh, collapse this and turn it over to you uh, to kick over, uh, uh, kick into our conversation about uh, uh, how these regulations intersect with license uh, re e-resources and how you handle uh, negotiations uh, with publishers. We've heard some allusions to that already. Uh, so looking forward to your thoughts, uh, Sam, over to you. Thanks, Blake. Um, so I wanted to just start off. I'm experiencing some spotty campus Wi-Fi, so please bear with me. Um, and I wanted to start by getting into the nitty gritty of why we think that uh, this regulation applies to licensed e-resources and what our interpretation is. Um, so as mentioned a little bit by Nancy Horton earlier, the DOJ has implemented new technical requirements that requires that web content be made available by state entities, whether directly or through third parties via licensing or agreements. Um, and that these be provided to people with disabilities according to the guidelines set forth in WCAG 2.1 at level AA. Um, unfortunately, within the regulation, web content is not explicitly defined. So we're unable to say for certain whether web content only includes that which is made publicly available online, or rather if it also pertains to e-resources that are made available to authorized users and exist behind authentication walls. With a cautious approach, we've interpreted the DOJ's use of web content to apply to e-resources in part because of the statements in Appendix D that explain why the changes were made. Specifically, in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, the language initially read that a public entity makes available to members of the public or uses uh, to offer services, programs, or activities to members of the public. However, in the final rule, the DOJ dropped the phrase members of the public and instead references web content and mobile apps that a public entity provides or makes available. Since the broader language use of makes available is used in comparison to makes available to members of the public, we believe this applies to licensed e-resources, even those meant for authorized users behind authentication walls. 
Furthermore, the notice of proposed rulemaking proposed an exception for password protected course content, but the DOJ dropped that exception in response to pushback during the comment period, which could be another indication that web content is meant to include openly available content and content that requires user authentication. Uh, and so Catherine has some slides that she's going to put up for me, um, but I wanna get into uh, our negotiation strategy, specifically at Berkeley for uh, acquiring born accessible materials, as Claire was mentioning, um, and moving away from doing modifications after the fact. So regardless of whether you believe this ruling applies to your licensed e resources or not, you can still utilize license agreements in order to achieve the same accessibility outcomes. In fact, the DOJ has expressly stated that the anticipated result of this new ruling will be more accessible licensed content. This too is UC Berkeley's approach to licensing. Our strategy is publicly reflected within our digital accessibility statement on the library's website, which allows us to be transparent about the licensing process and the kinds of things that we negotiate for. For example, typically, most libraries will ask for a VPAT during licensing to determine the resources level of compliance, and then if necessary, the library or the campus's disability office will make modifications based on the needs of its users at their request. At Berkeley, we've been going a step further by placing the onus on vendors and publishers to make sure their resources are accessible when we receive them, which is otherwise known as born accessible materials. This eliminates the work of having to make reasonable modifications after the fact or seek an exception on the basis of undue burden. It also helps us to avoid a liability on the campus's end as we've established that it's the vendor's responsibility first and foremost to provide us with accessible materials and that we're not purchasing non-accessible materials if we can help it. So how do we go about this? Unsurprisingly, and like many other universities, we first ask for a current VPAT to ensure that we are always aware of any accessibility limitations and are prepared to meet the needs of our authorized users with disabilities. We then implement new language in our contract that asks for a warranty or representation that the vendor is compliant with California state and federal accessibility laws, as well as the web content and access guidelines, formerly at level 2.0, but we've started negotiating for 2.1 in accordance with the new regulation. Um, and if Catherine could switch the slide, um, there is some sample language that I can show you. Um, so this is typically what we use. It asks for California, federal, and WCAG compliance. And then additionally, we ask for representation that the vendor will make reasonable efforts to solve any accessibility issues that arise so that the responsibility to resolve complaints falls to the publisher instead of the library's technical staff or the campus's Office of Disability Access and Compliance. And then moving to the next section of the contract that we edit, um, we go down to the warranty disclaimer section of the contract where you'll typically find language that says something along the lines of the vendor disclaims all warranties and provides the licensed materials as is. So we've started adding language that prohibits the vendor from disclaiming the accessibility warranty that they just provided us by adding except with respect to express warranties in front of those statements. So except with respect to express warranties, they can disclaim anything else, but they cannot disclaim the warranty they just provided that their material is WCAG compliant. And then we move on to the indemnification section. Um, so similarly, we apply the same type of language. The contract will usually say the vendor shall not be held liable for any damages, which we amend to be, except with respect to any express warranties, vendor shall not be held liable for any damages. By adding this, if the university gets sued based on accessibility claims, then there are already contractual terms established that would have the vendor indemnify us and would shift that legal responsibility onto the vendor. This also helps the university with potential PR issues that would arise from an accessibility lawsuit, as we can point to our efforts to work with vendors that have specifically promised to provide accessible materials when we entered the agreement. 
Additionally, it's worth mentioning that you could also negotiate for the publisher failing to provide accessible material to be considered a material breach of the contract. UC Berkeley does not currently do this, but we are in the process of working with our general counsel to establish language for this that we could incorporate into our contracts and boost our overall accessibility strategy. Um, so lastly, to talk about the outcomes, we've been doing this for about two years now and have found that the vast majority of vendors have been very accepting of our new contract language with very little negotiation involved. Occasionally, smaller vendors won't accept certain parts of the accessibility warranty, like agreeing to California state law if their business resides in a different state, or even uh, our federal law if they reside in a different country. But we'll narrow down their concern and adapt our language accordingly to ensure that we get an accessibility warranty that's agreeable for both parties and as close to the original language as possible. Um, we typically can agree on WCAG compliance, as that's a standard that's somewhat universal and not dependent on uh, any statute or legislation. Another negotiation hurdle we encounter is vendors wanting to say that they will endeavor or make best efforts to comply with the ADA. Um, in these situations, we like to remind them that they are obligated to comply with federal laws, whether they warrant to or not. And we'll simply remove mention of federal law from our clause and stick with just WCAG. Uh, but I think it is important that we reiterate to publishers and vendors that this is something that they are expected to comply with. Uh, thankfully, we have not yet encountered the need to walk away from a negotiation due to being unable to secure a representation of compliance with accessibility standards. In full transparency, were this issue to come up in the near future, it's unlikely that we'd be able to walk away from a negotiation entirely solely due to an accessibility concern, as it would not be a widely supported outcome within our specific library. However, our university is currently in the process of changing the guidelines around this, which will require us to pursue a waiver if we cannot reach acceptable accessibility terms or would face undue burden. We don't know the details of this process yet, but we do know that it will shed light on uh, it will shed light to library stakeholders on the importance of acquiring accessible materials and set the tone on the principles the university is willing to uphold. Overall, it's been very encouraging to see such willingness and cooperation from vendors to provide born accessible materials, and we're excited to continue tweaking our strategy in order to secure the best possible accessibility outcomes for our users and hopefully create a positive shift within the library and publishing spheres. Um, and with that, I'm happy to turn it back over to Blake. Awesome, Sam. Thanks so much. And I want to come back to some of these licensing uh, questions in our discussion. Uh, but it's time to shift over uh, to our discussion. So uh, if folks have uh, additional questions, uh, please drop them in the chat and I will try and pick them up. But we've had a few already. Um, so I want to pick up uh, with uh, one that John Berger uh, raised about private universities. And Nancy, I'm hoping I can pull you back into the conversation here. Obviously, Title II doesn't apply directly uh, to private entities who are generally governed by the Rehabilitation Act if they accept federal funds. Obviously, these regulations are under Title II and not under the Rehab Act. Um, Nancy, I'm wondering for your thoughts, and sorry, I should have specified, we have uh, two Nancys. I was uh, thinking of Nancy Horton, but Nancy Sims, please feel free to weigh in as well. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, how the courts, about how the Department of Justice, and, and Claire Stanley, you may have some thoughts about this as well, um, might import uh, some of the substance of these new Title II regs when they're applying the Rehab Act in the context of private universities? Um, well, this is Nancy Horton. Um, I mean, a couple things. Yeah, Title II doesn't apply to private entities. Uh, Title III applies to a lot of private entities. Um, you know, as some of you may be aware, when the DOJ first started their rulemaking around this topic, they planned, as they have done in the past, to make uh, two, two rules, one for Title II and one for Title III simultaneously. Um, they, they backed away from that in recent years for a number of reasons. And 
one of which was they thought, well, let's let's start with Title II and let's learn how that goes. Um, but as many of you may be aware, you know, the Department of Justice uh, um, you know, took the position that both Title II and Title III reach uh, online services and activities and things in 1996, you know, long, long time ago, and have done, uh, you know, work and enforcement work and entered all kinds of settlement agreements. And there have been all kinds of court cases uh, for many, many years. And in recent years, DOJ has entered uh, lots and lots of settlement agreements in, with both public and private entities, but a lot of uh, public entities under Title II uh, using uh, WCAG as as a technical um, you know standard to to measure compliance. And so there were a couple of reasons why they did the rule the way they did and why they chose the WCAG and the version that they chose because people had have had a lot of time to be familiar uh, with with these concepts. Now, because section because Title II of the ADA is really modeled very closely on Section 504, I often refer to them as, you know, twin twin sons of different Congresses. Um, you know, they're they're just very very similar, and a lot of other federal agencies, for example, Department of Education, HUD, um, have entered settlement agreements and resolution. Uh, agreements and things of that nature on on this on these issues, access to web content and so forth, uh, for a long time. So I think it's not unreasonable to expect that Section five hundred four would be viewed in a, in a very similar light to Title two, and when it comes to Title three, I think that's again we'll we'll get there. Um, we'll get there. Um, that may be down the road a piece, and the details might be different based on a number of factors, both related to the distinctions between the two titles and maybe what we learn with the implementation of this rule under Title II. But again, the Department of Justice already considers Title III to reach the websites and mobile apps of covered entities. Title III's coverage is narrower. It's more specific than Title II's, which is broad. It just covers everything state and local governments do. And courts have been a little more accepting of that sort of broad application of Title II than what we've seen around Title III. So I think private institutions, I think if they're covered by 504, you know, it'd be wise to maybe just sort of use this rule as guide as a guideline and and follow it because you're gonna it's gonna put you in a good position come what may yeah nancy yes. i i was i was hoping that was going to be your thought that um this the whatever the sort of uncertainty about the application of title three of the ada and the specific contours of section 504 which no doubt does apply um to a lot of private uh entities that a, a good way to resolve that uncertainty is to look to the the um title two regs so i think that's a that's a help, helpful answer um and uh john hope that uh, gets at your conversation I want to shift gears and invite in Rachel Sandberg, uh, who has been sharing some uh, thoughts in the chat and having an exchange with Nancy that I think is uh, would be a helpful one for us to uh, bring up live, which is in this approach to, um, to to how we manage risk or what's the what's the sort of motivation to guide us through uh, all of the uncertainty that we have uh, discussed today. Rachel, you and Nancy uh, were having an exchange about this in the chat. So turn it over to you and then Nancy, give you a chance to respond. Sure. Um, Nancy and I know each other well, and uh, we're, we're not really on uh, opposite sides of things here. Um, but what I wanted to flag, uh, just because remarks had to be so brief, um, was just to clarify that um, I, I take very well Nancy's point that um, rather than scare everyone about this new regulation, let's give people concrete ways to show them how we can comply with it. 
um, and that is an empowering thing to do. And therefore, um, if we focus on that and focus less on, on risk, then um, we're, we're not intimidated from moving forward. And um, at least in the context of e-resources, I think all of that's very true. You heard from Samantha that we have ways that we're moving forward to empower um, the library to get accessible content that complies um, through our license agreements. However, if we don't also bring in the notion of very serious risk of non-compliance, um, then it is increasingly difficult to get buy-in for pursuing these and, and taking a strong position in our license agreement. So you heard from Samantha, um, who was very diplomatic about saying, oh, I don't think we could walk away. And I would say you would see dead bodies um, in our library if we walked away on the basis of accessibility. And we can bridge that intellectual gap with the rest of campus and the rest of the librarians who are um, acquiring content for campus to show them information like, hey, did you look at um, the, the DOJ's actual uh, explanation in the rule that showed that remediation costs for higher education institutions are $5.5 billion um, a year. So, you know, we have to back it up with um, very credible information about what the scope of risk actually is if we don't get accessible content in order to um, support the ways that we are empowered to move forward. And that was the only point I wanted to make. Nancy, your response. Yeah, um, as as Rachel says, we really do fundamentally agree here. I think it's going to be incredibly key to help other stakeholders on campus realize what compliance actually means to be able to say there are true compliance burdens here, uh, especially if the other stakeholders on campus really aren't realizing that yet. We are we are lucky at the University of Minnesota in that the general counsel's office is already on top of this and is already looking at uh, compliance uh, across the university. Um, and I also really, really appreciate Sam's presentation of the the techniques for license uh, uh, licensed e-resource uh, negotiation and uh, you know enforcing that kind of stuff. One of the things that uh, changes my angle here just a little bit is that I've been in several conversations with people from my library and from other institutions trying to figure out things about, how, so we, we have large stockpiles of digitized collections. We, they're already up there. Many of them are not accessible. Um, many of them, what, one example I threw in the chat is oral history recordings of obscure historical dialects of speech from immigrant communities. Certainly, I actually think we should be remediating all of those. In fact, I am uh, enough of a stickler for accessibility that when I was first told to make videos for my job for educating people on campus about copyright, I said, how are we going to do captions? And they said, we don't have funds to do captions. And so then I said, we're not doing videos then. We aren't, I, I was, that was a fundamental for me. So yes, we have needed to be doing this for a while. Um, but when we are looking at our piles of digitized content, something like an obscure historical dialect oral recording, or even, which we also have in the University of Minnesota Library's digital collections, uh, scanned copies of hymnals in obscure dialects, again, from Swedish immigrant communities or things like that, making those fully accessible certainly should be done might be a little lower priority than making the things that are currently being used in courses, the things that are currently being subscribed, the newly digitized things, all of this should be accessible. What do we make accessible first? The more heavily used things, the more important things, and the things that will cost less because something like an obscure historical dialect of a language is the sort of thing that could sit in uh, some kind of a, a undue burden in terms of compliance. Can we hire an expert who actually speaks that language? We might not be able to find anybody, for example. So. 
That's that's terrific, Nancy. Thanks. Um, I, I want uh, to pick up on a point that you just raised and invite either uh, you or uh, Rachel or Sam uh, or Hannah to jump in on this topic of collaboration across the institution. Obviously, some of these are problems, uh, are, are, are kind of problems and uh, strategies that uh, IT uh, folks have been developing in the procurement of, uh, of information technology. Um, Obviously, Nancy, you mentioned uh, the need to collaborate with the university council. I'm just wondering if folks have tips on how they have successfully leveraged relationships, either in a really productive way, it sounds like, Nancy, uh, you had with, with university council, uh, maybe borrowing best practices from, from folks that have been leading on, on IT issues, or going the other way, if you've got recalcitrant university council or um, IT folks that are, that are sort of running behind and, and you're leading at the institution, how have you handled that kind of cross-campus dynamic? jump ball for the for for anyone who has thoughts on that um we love our council and we're very proactive with them um and it, it helps that we're up to speed on everything going on so when we approach council it's doing it with a, a reading of here's what we think uh this means here's what we think we're able to do what do you think? And getting council's buy-in has been essential. Um, and it's been essential to like vet uh, practical ways forward too. I mean, you don't have to think that council is going to say no, or you have to do this. Council understands risk um, and, and nothing is going to be perfect. It, it, everything is, is a question of like, what is our exposure? Um, if we can't do this. So I, I think taking that, you know, respecting that council has that kind of pragmatic approach um, should make it less intimidating to move forward. I think another thing to do is to build relationships with um, your disability and accessibility offices of, of various ilk. So when we made our um, statement for how our electronic resources and our electronic collections comply um, with federal law, we partnered with them in creating that statement to get buy-in so that it doesn't create some kind of hostile relationship where of, of fear and mistrust that we're doing things in the library that somehow you know don't serve the interests of, of the university. So establishing those relationships has been instrumental for how we've moved forward. Thanks, Rachel. Pausing just a moment to see if anyone else wants to chime in on that front. Looking around, seeing now eager volunteers. I'll just say as well um, here at CU, um, one of the approaches that, that our folks have had is having a sort of centralized accessibility governance council that brings together representatives from the faculty assembly, from the libraries, from IT, from university council to sort of regularly dig into these, these kind of shared policy uh, questions. Um, so that's super uh, helpful. I guess one other collaboration point that, that comes to mind, um, and, and Rachel, you may have thoughts on this or, or others as well. Um, are, are there any sort of collaborations across universities? Obviously people are negotiating with the same publishers uh, over the, the same issues. Maybe there are some antitrust uh, questions to, to, to worry about there, um, but I know that's a conversation that's come up on the IT procurement side of the fence. How does that look from your vantage point setting, uh, working across universities? Um, I think if you ask our council, they might have a slightly different take from my my take on this. But mine is we we have been very vocal about strategy, and I don't see strategy as an antitrust issue um, because we're not uh, trying to control price um, by colluding with other institutions. We're giving language to show institutions how to comply um, with the law while also getting certain outcomes. Um, I think if you, you know, there are some kind of consortial discussions that might get closer to having an antitrust problem, but at least in the ways that we've been um, educating and, and moving forward, I don't think that that's an issue. But I, what I will say is that, and I just put a, a note in, in the chat, 
if you are in a public institution with multiple campuses, don't assume for a second that any of those other campuses have the same strategy or even know what your strategy is. Um, and, it, you know, it, in the UC, we have campus council and every other UC campus also has campus council and they're not even talking to each other. And it's not for like, you know, uh, lack of desire. It's just the, the scope, the breadth, everything is so big and everyone is so busy. So you do have a very important role as an individual. If you understand these issues and you're working you know, towards a better outcome in your library, I think it's really important within your system or within your consortia uh, to, to actually provide that education and to, to do the outreach because um, every campus has different levels of familiarity um, and expertise. Thanks, Rachel. And wanted to pick up a comment from Amy Dreyer in the chat who says that the Library Accessibility Alliance has been uh, sending uh, letters to vendors, um, maybe to take some of that uh, that sort of communication uh, out of the out of the universities and and have it come from uh, from a from a national organization might be another uh, a sort of strategy um, to think about. Um, uh, there's also uh, for folks that that have not been uh, taking uh, are, are, are uh, paying attention to the chat uh, a, a good set of questions from uh, Julie Rudder and uh, about some specific examples. I will refer folks to the uh, chat on on that one um, so that we don't uh, surface them here. Um, I guess in our last few minutes, um, and I, I'm looking over uh, at Catherine just to make sure. Um, Catherine, I, I wanted to bring Claire uh, back. Back in for for a couple of closing uh, thoughts from uh, the community before I, I I turn it over to you to 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 wind us out. Are we doing okay on time? We're good. Thank you. Claire wanted to come to you uh, for a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, we heard from Sam uh, about uh, the possibilities of aiming beyond the regulation. So, for example, asking for vendors for things like compliance with WCAG 2.1 um, or, or being a little bit more forward looking, being a little bit more thoughtful. Um, I imagine there are also some things that might not be specifically covered by the regs, but that might be problematic. So. Um, thinking about the web overlay and AI conversation uh, that has unfolded in other contexts. I'm wondering if also if there are some particular practices, some particular approaches uh, that you would encourage folks to avoid. So things folks can, can do to go above and beyond, things folks might avoid as they are approaching these regs that might not be, be so specifically spelled out. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's always the the concept, right, that, you know, you can adhere to the letter of the law, but, you know, thinking more um, broadly about wh why we ask for these regulations. And of course, you, you have set regulations because it tells you what to do. But the bigger concept is that we want to have access to the materials. Again, giving the example of a student working on their dissertation who needed access to all kinds of materials and couldn't access them. And so you don't have the breadth and the depth of resources to really sink your teeth into the research and, and really be able to access all those kinds of things. So just trying to think creatively about ways to um, get the resources out there, even if you can't meet, and I don't know if this is slightly sidestepping your question, Blake, but thinking about how you can provide the resources, even if you can't give everything right then and there that complies with the regulations. Um, one thing that kept crossing my mind as we were talking was, okay, so maybe you can't make all documents 100% accessible right here, right now, because we get it. That's that's a, a huge you know, burden to bear. But knowing your students, knowing your audience, maybe you know you have a PhD candidate who's studying um, each ancient Chinese history or something like that. Maybe you be especially active in that community. Not to say that you shouldn't work on other things. Of course, if we could wave our magic wand, we would have everything. But knowing your audience so that you can really sink your teeth into what's going to help your students, your um, professors, your whatever, right then and there so that you can really um, make a difference in what people need at that given time. 
Um, just the, the ability to interact with the websites, of course, which is the given under the uh, the new regulations for the website. But I think we've been talking very um, broadly about actually the ar the archived content, so the documents that people um, are are accessing. But if you can't use the website itself, um, the search system to get to the documents, well, then having accessible documents is per pointless because if I can't get to them, then what's the point? So making sure that those kinds of things are accessible. Um, Blake, you talked about AI. That's a really big new thing um, in the disability advocacy space. We keep pointing out the pros and cons of AI. It could make a world of difference because it could open up a lot of doors. But like a lot of things, if you don't think about accessibility from the get-go, we're going to be left behind. So using it as a tool, not as something to leave us behind, so to speak. Uh, the blind community sees that in a lot of different contexts. So um, I, I, I hope that answers your question, Blake, but just thinking more broadly about how things are applied and the resources that you're providing. Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, one thing that's come up in some of these other conversations is being aware of snake oil in remediation and, and sort of chasing these uh, deadlines. There are a lot of uh, vendors that are pro sort of promising the world with uh, AI. And I, I think the encouragement for folks to keep accessibility substance in uh, as, as the primary goal and to evaluate carefully those uh, tools. Claire, one more thing before uh, we leave it that I wanted to dive in. You talked about um, getting to know uh, your community on campus, getting to know um, your your patrons uh, with, with disabilities that are that are relying on the library. Um, obviously, those those relationships can be be a little bit challenging to form, particularly when new students are coming in and trying to figure out which way is up and uh, may not uh, there may not just be obvious uh, communication links. What what strategies do you recommend uh, for uh, for for libraries to to, to build those links to um, disabled students, disabled faculty? Are there student organizations, faculty organizations at lots of universities that are good, good points of contact? What other thoughts uh, do you have for uh, folks to connect and, and try and forge those relationships? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a great point and a great question. There is so many different ways you can commute, uh, connect, excuse me, with the disability community. A lot of uh, universities have disability advocacy clubs for both undergrads and also at law schools. Um, there are a lot of associations like who I work with, the American Council of the Blind. We have a student affiliate called ACB Students um, and they have state chapters. So reaching out to those different entities, um, I wouldn't be surprised, for instance, if the National Association of the Deaf also has a student affiliate. So reaching out to those existing entities to say, hey, you know, the University of California. I was actually a, a student undergrad and grad school at the University of California system. So it's fun to hear from you guys. Um, reaching out to the California Council of the Blind and saying, you know, the UC system wants to talk with blind students. How can we get you guys involved? They would love that because it's it's a great way to bring bring the conversation together again in not so much of an adversarial like you will uh, comply with the law but more of a like how can we work together to make sure that everything is working the way it should um so yeah working with either entities on campus or other external organizations because there's a lot of them i guarantee if you guys ever need recommendations reach out to me and i can give you so many different links um, obviously, you have confidentiality, um, you know, rules as far as who's receiving services um, through disability services um, centers on campus. But for instance, I think it would be even great, you know, if you could just send out a blast email to everybody through the disability services center and say, hey, if you are trying to learn more about these new Title II regs and want to learn about what makes, you know, uh, resources accessible. Legal counsel might not like this idea, but <laughs> just thinking out loud, just having ways to say, hey, we want to engage with you. If you're a student and you want to put your heads together and, and work together, I think students would really appreciate that. Again, there are unfortunately some litigious people, but I'd say the other 98% of us, if we were approached and invited to sit at the table and brainstorm, we'd greatly appreciate it. 
Thanks, Claire. That's awesome. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the National Association of the Deaf. I think we have focused the, the conversation um, here uh, today primarily on uh, on blind students, but obviously uh, both uh, both deaf and hard of hearing uh, students uh, and then also uh, folks with cognitive intellectual and learning disabilities are really important uh, part of, uh, of the community that uh, needs to be served under these uh, these regs. Um, as as well as folks with physical and mobility uh, disabilities. Um, and I think also another thing that's come up in these conversations is remembering too that we're, uh, we might be primarily focused on students, but that there are different tranches of students. We also have faculty and staff who rely on, on libraries. So thinking about what that broader matrix looks like, uh, super important. Uh, Rachel, I uh, wanna go over to you and then we're just about out of time. So I'll give you the last word on our discussion and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, John and Catherine to close us out. Sorry to, to uh, eat up this last second, um, I, but just to add on the uh, understanding of audiences here, yes, it's students and yes, it's faculty and it's staff, but we're public institutions. And to Nancy's point earlier, we digitize uh, our special collections and put them available online for the world. Um, so it is just as important that all of our um, public facing materials um, uh, meet uh, meet these standards. And, you know, I'm sure many of you know that um, when Berkeley had put up old course content, you know, from decades ago that didn't have captions, there was a DOJ enforcement order that, um, you know, that that we, we're complying with. So it becomes a question of prioritization and what your available resources are. And maybe you are prioritizing uh, the, the work with students, but um, it, it doesn't mean that you uh, are gonna escape the court of public opinion um, for the materials that you have online um, that are public facing and that don't comply. I that, that's a great note to end on. Before I give it to, to Catherine uh, and, and John to close us out, I, I just want to uh, highlight uh, Brandon Butler and John Band, who have been patiently hanging out in the audience and delightfully no one has asked any questions about uh, copyright law. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can assume that there are... Uh, <laughs> Copyright law is a is an, a pretty optimistic situation that we have lots of uh, great exceptions and limitations uh, that we can rely on uh, in these issues. But no, uh, if you have questions about the copyright uh, angles that uh, ARL uh, has a, a great network of folks who are well uh, versed on those questions as well. Um, and with that, I will hand it back uh, to, to Catherine and then also John Berger, who I, has been mentioned by name a couple of times, but is the uh, Executive Director uh, of the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries, our ACERL, and one of the uh, founders of the Library Accessibility uh, Alliance. Catherine and John, over to you to close us out. Thanks, Blake. Thanks to all the speakers and participants. This um, this is this is not the end of this conversation. I hope if there's one takeaway, it's that, right? We're in this together and there's there's lots that we can do and I really appreciate it. Um, John, do you want to say, I have some next steps. I'm actually maybe going to invite Amy Dreyer if you want to chime in as well. Um, uh, but John, do you want to say like one word about the Library Accessibility Alliance as, as a co-founder, um, just for folks who might not know? Uh, one word, uh, probably more <laughs> than one, but um, for the folks who don't know the Library Accessibility Alliance, um, here is the website. Um, the Big Ten has been doing uh, accessibility compliance on electronic resources for seven or eight years now. Um, ACERL joined them in 2019, and then together we created the Library Accessibility Alliance and have since brought in several more consortia. Um, many of you um, on this call um, belong to one or more of those consortia. Um, so uh, the idea being that, you know, what can we do together as a group so we don't all have to do it over and over and over again individually at our local institutions? Um, and we've been pretty successful at that. And um, we're doing a lot of uh, awareness raising and training. Um, people with the specialized expertise like Amy have are few and far between. Um, and uh, uh, people are just learning on the job. Um, it's, this is a relatively new topic of concern for people who have been in libraries for a long period of time. It's not been a topic taught in library schools. So what can we do to address that gap? Um, and has been mentioned in here, um, we have been already started doing outreach to vendors um, to say, you know, in case you didn't know, there is this law um, uh, or regulation and, you know, what are you gonna do about it? Um, uh, the 
the licensing language from uh, from Berkeley is wonderful. Um, uh, the Library Accessibility Alliance recommends licensing language. Um, that the Berkeley language is not currently in the language that we recommend, and that's something I think we need to redress. So um, uh, I will stop there. Um, technically, I'm not on the steering committee. I, I cycled off a couple of weeks ago, but my chair is still warm for my five years serving in that chair. But uh, but Amy is the chair, and Liz Larang just came on. So um, if Amy wants to to add anything that I missed, I certainly welcome her comments. I think I think that Liz had to drop. Yeah, Amy, please feel free. I'll I'll um since I uh I'll note that Amy and I. So I knew John, but I met Amy through attending all these webinars and things. And one thing that Amy and I have talked about are kind of this idea of contributing some of the the big questions that Hannah raised at the beginning of our discussion here. I'm kind of contributing them to a running list that ALA has been collecting. I think, and they're I think they plan to create kind of a, a frequently asked questions answer bank. And so I think the idea there is to collaborate with experts like Nancy Horton, um, who's on our call, maybe some DOJ experts as well, um, to kind of, I don't know, like we do our own interpretation and then sort of see, you know, if, if, it, if it jives with, with the intent of the regulation. So that's one thing um, that we've talked about as like an explicit sort of next step. And I also want to note, um, so I have grabbed the chat and we'll sort of see if we can anonymize those questions and contribute them. And Nora, I, I don't mean to leave you hanging. I, I will try to, um, to connect you with Nancy to get an answer to your specific question. Um, another opportunity for further collaboration with Library Accessibility Alliance and others is engaging with the publishing community. We've heard a lot about that today from Samantha, from Claire, from others. And so um, there's conversations around what can we do with library publishers, with commercial vendors, you know, on, on accessible publishing. And then um, we'll also continue, I'll speak for ARL, um, we'll definitely continue to advocate for born accessible publishing, just as we have, you know, in our in our comments um, on the Title II NPRM. Um, so um, I don't know, Amy, we've left you like 30 seconds. So if you want to say anything, okay, here we go. She's, um, Amy has noted that, uh, yes, that LA is working with the Library Publishing Coalition to address um, publishing accessibility as well. So there's a lot happening in this space and um, there's definitely going to be more to come. So um, I, that's it for me. Just gratitude to all of you. And we'll we'll reach out with our updated resource and keep, keep you posted on next steps. And um, thank you for all your work in this space. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks. Thank you, Blake, too. That was great. I think you're muted. Thanks. I was just going to hang on for two seconds.